Hey, welcome to a conversation with my name is Philip DeFranco and possibly our, our final conversation of the year. We, we might change it up, but possibly uh, is the fantastic John Green. Hello, sir. How you doing? Nice to see you. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I mean, I think it's uh, I'm glad we were able to get you on. I think I feel like you sent Hank to the podcast first to, <laughs> to just like to feel it out, make sure it's not a gotcha yeah. podcast. And then, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. how is a actually, if you don't know who John Green is, how dare you? But uh, John, I mean, at, at this point, what do you, do you consider yourself an author first or you, you and your brother have so many different jobs? Yeah, just just as you do as well. But I, w I was an author before I was a YouTuber. My first book came out before YouTube even existed, really. And so I think of myself as a writer first, because that was my my job before being a YouTuber was part of my job. But I also think of myself as a YouTuber. And for those of you who don't know, Hank, my brother Hank and I started making YouTube videos just a few months after Phil started, I think, uh, back on January 1st, 2007. And so over the last 13 years, my brother and I've had a conversation back and forth on YouTube, but we've also expanded to do lots of other different educational video projects like Crash Course and SciShow and uh, Eons, The Art Assignment, lots of other shows. You, you guys, have, but you've done so much. And I'm like, it's weird because I'm always like, I'm proud of you. And then 10% of me is like, I resent you because you guys have done such an amazing job. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say. Um, I feel that way about all of my my colleagues, about 90% yeah. amazement and wonder and really proud of them. And then 10% like, why can't I do that? My brother is the is the driving force. I'm really the tail to the comet, to be honest with you. Even though I'm the older brother, like he's the CEO and I literally report to him and I have my <laughs> annual, you know, check-ins where he tells me the parts of my job that I'm bad at and everything. So <laughs> I can see I'm him just, doing that. I can I, see him doing that for you. I'm just, I'm just following his lead, really. I, uh, but I think uh, y'all's relationship, obviously, I, I'm, I'm like every most other people. I look at it from the outside in, but it feels like one where, no matter how much time in between you guys have having conversations, it feels like you guys probably keep yourselves in check, like humble each other. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, it's it's huge for both of us to have the other person to lean on both for context, you know, the, the, as you know, this can be a little bit of a disorienting career because there aren't a lot of other people who do it. And I mean, at least there aren't that many people in Indianapolis or my brother lives in Missoula, Montana who do it. And so, you know, I, I don't necessarily have that daily interaction with, with colleagues in the same way. Like I have interactions with people I work with on projects and that's wonderful, but it's not the same as with my brother. And and just the level of trust that we've built up in each other over the years is just really, really valuable. And I can't imagine, like, I, I wouldn't make YouTube videos if it weren't for Hank. Well, because I was going to say, at, th at this point, because you've hit, in so many different areas, different levels of success, whether it be a starting a VidCon or um, with the videos themselves or uh, with, obviously, the, the books. I mean, specifically, uh, The Fault in Our Stars. I mean... You, we, before we started filming, you were like, that was like the most insane moment. I was talking about how it was on my radar because I, I saw that you beat out Edge of Tomorrow when that was when that movie was released. Like, why for you? Why do you still create? Is it is it ver still related to why you wanted to be an author in the first place and why you started making YouTube videos? What what is it? Because it's obviously at this point not money. No, but it. it it really wasn't ever money. I mean, right. we started out just like you on, on YouTube before there was even a way of imagining it ever making money. I mean, it, it didn't even exist on our radar as a possibility. We did it because it was thrilling and, and it was exciting. And, you know, 2006 YouTube was such a exciting, weird, eccentric place. There's this great Gertrude Stein essay where she talks about the difference between art that is that is interesting to people and art that is really thrilling to people and youtube felt really thrilling to us the the not just not the videos themselves so much as the stuff being built around the videos i know you like us were big fans of zay frank's the show and the show was great but the community around the show the right. stuff that the that people did with zay or in response to zay's work was so interesting and so powerful and that's why we started making youtube videos and on some level like that's still what i find interesting about it it's still for me a very community driven enterprise and so every 
Monday, when I sit down to write a video and work on a video, I'm always thinking about that sense of of connectedness that I feel. And I writing books is a very different sense of connectedness because it isn't as quick. Uh, it isn't as intimate. It isn't, especially because I write fiction. So like I'm not writing about myself and I'm not really writing for myself. But when I make a YouTube video, I'm making it for Hank but I'm also making it for the people who I know are, are going to watch it. And on some level, like I'm making it so that I can be part of a conversation with those people. And that is still really exciting to me. And and if if and when it stops being exciting, I think is when we'll s- stop making videos. Have you uh, have you hit one of those moments where you were like, I'm just not going to do this? And and what what kind of sparked that? Oh, there have been a bunch of times over the years. I mean, now I see it as like a sine wave, you know, the the motivation comes and goes. And once you understand that like, oh, this is a trough, not an emergency, you start to think of it differently. Mm -hmm. Because the first couple of times you experience the trough, you're like, this is an emergency. And then eventually you're like, oh, no, I'm just like bored with this. And if I keep going, it'll get interesting again. I There have definitely been times when I was like, (laughs) <laughs> I'm really tired of doing this and it's really hard and I don't know I don't know if I have anything left to say. I don't know if I can be of use to the people who we're trying to make stuff for. Um I've actually felt that a lot less in the last few years. I, I think because I've felt a lot more connected to the audience. I mean there's this weird phenomenon and I don't know if you've experienced this. I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this, but I, I we felt like there was this weird phenomenon where when our community got bigger, it almost got less interesting and less powerful. It, it was harder to do stuff together. Um, and and even like projects like our big charity projects, like the Project for Awesome, like even the five times more people were watching our videos, we weren't having five times the impact in terms of fundraising, but also in terms of like community engagement around our our. F- philanthropic initiatives and stuff. And so it getting to like a more, the last few years, it's just felt really lovely again. It's felt almost like 2007 again. And it's that, so I I felt really motivated during those years, but there was definitely a period in the 2015, 2016 era when like partly because my mental health wasn't good and partly just because I was really tired. Um, it was a struggle. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I was going to say, I say this. No, it just popped in my head right now. I think just, I think positive emotions don't scale. I think negative emotions yeah. scale. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that does. But yeah, at a certain point, you're just like, am I hitting a mark? And I'll find myself having, getting more, more joy. And obviously it's a little bit of a content difference. I find myself getting more joy out of a, a secret live stream that I do with like my text mm-hmm. line where it's like, 30,000 people might stroll through or like you have 7,000 concurrence or something like that uh, than if I'm doing something and it's getting a million views. It's just, it's, it's different. You can actually see and you hope to interact and like there, there are probably like eight people in the community that continually like tweet something at me and I like, I recognize them and that, that makes me feel happy um, because yeah, it is, it's hard. I think the positive emotions don't, don't scale, especially after you do it this long, right? It, yeah. It's, it's the yeah, for sure. one, like it's such a good problem to have, but it's, it's one of the, the bad parts of having ultra success, even if it's momentary, uh, because <laughs> I feel like our brains fry or like it's, it's a, it's a drug. Yeah. It's, it is very much a drug and, um, like it, it's an intoxicant literally. Like I, I found, you know, the the kind of fame where I was relatively near the, you know, the center of pop culture for for a hot second, um, intoxicating, but but like just as uh, there's a thing called marginal utility. Like if you drink one beer, you feel like quite a bit better than you you did before, and then if you drink two beers, you feel like somewhat less better, but still better. And then if you drink like f- f- five beers, the curve. Uh, begins to invert and you start to feel like significantly worse than you did at at zero beers. And uh, yeah, I definitely experienced that where there's a, there's a marginal utility to uh, celebrity or whatever 
Well, I mean, even after a while, it, 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 it becomes, it does sort of fry your brain. It becomes intoxicating in the sense that like, you can't help but want more of it, but like, it isn't actually making like your life or your core or, or in my case, I should, I can only speak for me. It wasn't actually making my life or my core relationships better. If anything, it was pulling me away from that stuff, more travel, more having to like do stuff, you know, outside of my family, outside of my core friendships. And and even outside of my core work, you know, like mm-hmm. I, I wasn't doing my core work then. I wasn't writing. I wasn't making crash course videos. And so that uh, was bad for me, even though it was like kind of what I had been told was the dream. Right. So that was something that I, I, I had to reckon with. Again, this is a leading edge problem. And I was always aware of the fact that it was not, you know, it was my problem, but it, it wasn't a uh, wasn't a proper problem. No, and let, let's let's understand that I'm I'm the one pulling this out of you, and you're not like, just complaining. Yeah, uh, yeah, but- yeah. I don't want to sound. I'm I'm very. I am I am genuinely really grateful that that all that happened, and that um, and that that book reached so many people. You know, that's something that I never ever imagined would happen with with my work, and so it was it was wonderful. That part of it was was and remains wonderful because the book is still reaching so many people all the time, and that's just lovely and strange and I'm extremely grateful for it. The the fame part of it is is in some ways separate from that though. Mm-hmm. And um and yeah there it was it, it was uh, not as enjoyable as it had been portrayed in the media. Like a lot of things. So so if you had to choose between uh being rich or famous, you're choosing rich? Oh, yeah. Well, just I think financial security allows you to a lot of um just yeah, I mean financial security is hugely hugely valuable yeah. um and i think sometimes people lose sight of that uh people who have it but so like um, on the uh, on the emotional end because we were kind of touching on it and yeah like so right behind you you have hundred <laughs> over a hundred thousand yeah. probably maybe a hundred fifty thousand pages that you're going to sign with a sharpie yeah. um yeah. in your head for my new book the anthropocene reviewed which comes out in may I'm not, I'm not afraid of some promo. Get it. Do it. Do it now. Most people wait till after two hours. <laughs> <laughs> do it. Plug it. Um, but so like for that, for you yeah. emotionally, if you were processing, 150,000 is wildly more than so many people could ever imagine. But for yeah. you, does it feel twice as good if that number becomes 300,000? And if it's half of that, is mm. it is it is it doubly or is that? depressing is that does that affect you on on a level or you're like no my story is going out to the people that are it's gonna hit yeah i mean i i think we have a bad habit this is something that logan smalley of ted ed said to me once and it really um has stuck with me he said that it's easy to confuse what's important with what's easy to measure and on youtube what's easy to measure is views and minutes watched and number of comments and like to dislike ratio and in publishing what's easy to measure is book sales but that's only a small part of where the real value is right like if somebody buys your book and they don't read it there's not a lot of value in in that for me i mean i guess there's the you know percentage of the price that I get or whatever. But the, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't write for that reason. Like I, I I write in the hopes of being able to connect with people. And so like my first book sold 8,000 copies in the first year after it was published, which, which was good. And, and it was, it, it was, you know, successful in its way. And I was really happy with how it did. But the reason I was really happy with how it did, didn't have anything to do with those numbers or prizes it won or anything like that. It was because of the responsive readers and hearing from them and, you know, feeling like the story had connected to some people. And I, I I mean, I would much rather write something or make something that matters deeply to people, to a few people than something that like a lot of people will, you know, will watch or will read. So I don't want to, so I try to make a point of not thinking about it in terms of just numbers and instead trying to remember that these are people. And that's one of the reasons actually why I like signing is that, you know, signing 150,000 sheets takes about 300 hours. It's a labor intensive process. Mm -hmm. There's no like, there's no way to speed it. Like there's no way to scale it up. It's just me here in my basement, you know, watching Netflix and listening to audiobooks. But it it helps me understand like what 150,000 means like mm-hmm. what it means that that many people would put 
you know, enough faith in my work to pre-order it. And so I, that's, that's a big part, I think, of why I find it helpful. I can see that. I mean, it, yeah, it helps you in the slightest way touch what is hopefully like the biggest thing that we do, but is intangible, like the impact that we have on like, the, it's right. Cause I, I would argue. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a big thing. I think I've realized this year is that I need to not stress the numbers and preserve that and more and think more of like, what is the impact that I want to have on individuals or, and obviously you get into a place where you start thinking of yourself in a, in a way that is much larger than you're probably having an impact on, but like, what's the impact that I want to have on the world? I want it to be a positive one. And I think yeah. that's, that's, yeah. it took me, it's taken me <laughs> 13 years of doing this to get to that point, but I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about finally arriving. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think the question is, I mean, all of us are going to move the needle a little this way or, 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 or that way in the fields where we work or in the fields that we care about. Like, some of us move the needle as fans, some of us move the needle as creators, like, you know, but I think the question is like, how the, the deep down question is, where do you put your attention, which is the only resource we really have, like in the end is our attention. And so to, to me, the question is like, where do you invest your attention and does that make life better for you, for people you care about, for your community, uh, for, for, you know, communities that may be distant from yours, but you care about a lot for whatever reason, like that, that's what I try to orient myself around instead of being like, well, how can I maximize the number of people who watch our videos? Or how can I maximize the number of copies I sell of the next book? I, that just to me, for, for me personally, is just like a recipe for burnout. Yeah. Well, okay. On that note, um, what, what is something that you do and you enjoy that is not a part of any business that you have launched? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a great question. And, uh, well, I mean, the, the answer, all, almost all of my time that is not spent working is spent with my family. Mm -hmm. And that's what I enjoy. I enjoy being with my kids. I enjoy learning with them. You know, like after this, I'm I'm gonna go be the dungeon master for my son's little Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you know, fourth grade Dungeons and Dragons group, and like, that's awesome. You know, yeah. like that's the most important writing I do every week is to write out the next scene of the thrilling adventure of Chult. <laughs> that's what it's. That's what it's called. That's like the land where this one takes place. Yeah, I love that. That's no, oh, it's fun. So like it's so stuff like that or, you know, my daughter loves to go on nature walks and, and, uh, has a great, uh, great eye for, uh, you know, for spotting animals and botany and stuff. And so that, that's the stuff that I do well, almost all the time that I'm not working. That's, that's cool. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't ask Hank about this either. Uh, did you guys, so like with how you're raising your kids and doing kind of like I'm using this word in a positive way, kind of like nerdier, like deeper sort of stuff. Is that is that the kind of upbringing y'all had, or what, what was yeah, what was your childhood like? Yeah, I mean, both of our parents worked in um, you know community development, nonprofit work. So my dad w worked for when I was a kid, worked for a land conservation organization called the Nature Conservancy, and my mom was a community activist working in under resourced neighborhoods, uh, lobbying for better resources, things like streetlights, paved roads in a lot of places when we were kids. And so we grew up with that, you know, on the table all the time. And my parents talking about uh, social justice. Um, and, you know, that was just a huge part of our that was that was the big biggest part of our lives. And then they were very focused on our education. So mm -hmm. they really wanted us to get a good education, um, work hard. You know, they I, I, I love my parents. They're two of my favorite people. They are still wonderful mentors to, to Hank and me. Um, but th they also like wanted us to do well. <laughs> like, they definitely, <laughs> there was, I, and I, I mean, I say, I, I, I think this is a good thing, but like they, you know, they supported us. Um, but they also really wanted us to like, to do well, to like push hard and to work hard and uh, we we did because we wanted to make them proud of us. I mean, still, like the only thing I really want out of my career is to make my parents proud. And that's I will say that's the the oddest thing of 
being now a uh, an adult in my 30s i <laughs> i think my parents are like the only people like kind of care about as far as what do they think about me yeah i mean it, it like it, it would, never goes away it would i mean it gutted me to disappoint my parents when i was a kid and it would gut me to disappoint my parents now i mean it just yeah i i look up to them a lot and i i, I still do and so i want them to feel like hank and i are doing good work and like we're being good to each other was there a was there a for um, this is more just for me uh was there a first time for you that you were like you, you looked at your parents, but you actually saw another person. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. W when you start to understand that they're humans. Yeah. I, I, went, I, I went away to boarding school when I was 14 and Hank was 11. And it was at some point then, in, which I think is common, at some point in high school, you know, I started to really differentiate myself from my parents. And, you know, because they were like, environmentalists and community activists like my way of differentiating myself was being like nature's stupid <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say yeah were you guys like rebelling and you're like i like uh i like uh trickle yeah. down economics i like capitalism and and i hate nature um <laughs> a little bit there was a, 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 definitely a, a small element of that um but i i i think that i did start to think of myself you know separate from them and and i started to understand that they were, you know, flawed, regular people, just like any other people in a way in adulthood that has made me admire them more because I understand more of the challenges of parenthood, the challenges of adulthood. Like when I was a kid, I thought adulthood was like a train station that you arrived at, you know, mm -hmm. and then they, you like got off the train and they were like, welcome to adulthood. You sit here until you die. And that was sort of how I imagined what it was like to be a grown up. But actually, it's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I I wish we could, did a better job of explaining to young people that like adulthood is not some like um di you know like zombie apocalypse that you run from until eventually <laughs> like the zombies get you and take you and turn you into an adult. Like adulthood is interesting, and you continue to grow and change, and you know life stays weird. Yeah. No, I was, it was top of my head. Cause, uh, I had a unexpected converse. Well, it was for my birthday a few days ago and my mom called me and it was the first time in my adult life that I saw her as something that was not a like two dimensional character. She actually, mm. she did that thing that parents don't do. Usually parents are like, that didn't happen. That wasn't a thing. She owned up to stuff unprompted. Mm. And I was mm. like, what? You can, mm. you as a, like a person in your sixties, you can still grow, <laughs> grow and change. Yeah. And I was like, that was for me, that was the, the wildest twist of 2020 is I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have like a good relationship with my mom because oh, she's, great. she's actually like, uh, yeah, can, can grow. And, uh, I don't know. It, it gave me a little hope. Cause I feel like, especially now we, we, we live in a time where it's hard not to feel like everyone's just hunkered down and that's all they'll ever be. And so it, it gave me this little glimmer of hope that I think I needed, not just for my mom, but for like people, for people in general, because it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's in, in that way, it's an, emo an emotionally exhausting time. It, the feeling of like, am I just talking to people who are agreeing with me or mm -hmm. is, is there, is there actually some road? And especially, I, I think it takes a lot of vulnerability when, it, when everyone is sort of hunkered down and is trying to protect themselves. And a lot of times, you know, they're trying to protect themselves because, they are at real risk of of being hurt emotionally it takes a lot of you know it takes a lot of guts and vulnerability to like come out from that bunker and you know try to say i'm sorry to try to own up to things to try to you know and to try to engage in a deep and meaningful way with with people you love like that's that's really hard and i think like the longer those relationships sort of calcify into what they what they are into the distance, the harder it is to like break out of that. Like, I remember there was like, I don't know, like seven years probably where I didn't say I love you to my parents. And it wasn't, it wasn't because I didn't love them. And it wasn't because they didn't love me. It just sort of like became a thing where it became harder to say. And then over time it becomes harder to say. And, and then finally saying it really is like an act of, of vulnerability and courage. So that's so cool that you, you felt like your mom was, was able to do that, man. Yeah, I don't know. I was, uh, <laughs> I was thrown off. It was the it was the biggest change of my. Well, I mean, not a lot has changed over the last few months. Actually, on that note, what is <laughs> has this has this 
because I mean, would you consider yeah. yourself uh, like someone who likes being by themselves? Has this year impacted yeah. you in a way that you didn't expect as someone that maybe refers to themselves like an introvert? Yeah, well, it has. I mean, it's been really difficult. A lot of the reasons why it's been difficult aren't because of introversion or extroversion. I mean, I have severe OCD, so I'm not totally... Uh, I don't have a brain that's particularly like well suited to a global pandemic, let's say. So that that that's a that's that's a non-ideal circumstance. Um and then it's just hugely it's hugely challenging for our kids. I mean, when mm. you're a kid, you, you, you so much of yourself is wrapped up in being with your peers. And that's so much of how you understand yourself. It's so much of how you understand the world. Like your peers tell you lots of things about the world that like your parents can't tell you or you don't trust your parents when they do tell you. <laughs> like, yeah. And so it's so important. And that has been really hard. Like that watching them have to figure out this e- e-learning despite the heroic efforts of their teachers has been really challenging, challenging for us, challenging for them, like a lot of tears on both sides. And then the, you know, the socialization part has been a, a little more challenging for me than I anticipated. Um, I've, I think you said in a video recently that like you, like as an introverted person, you thought that you couldn't get enough alone time, but it turns out that you can. <laughs> yeah. I had a, like, I, I had a uh, brief conversation the other day because um, I I got a pair of shoes. I got a new pair of running shoes. And it was like the most, it was probably a 20, 30 second conversation. It was the most I'd talked to anybody in outside of my family in like seven months, you know? And so I came home and I was like on a big high and I was telling the whole story to Sarah and every detail of it. And she was like, you have been energized by an encounter with a stranger, which is very unusual. Yeah, you, 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 it's maybe for like the first time realizing, oh yeah, we are social creatures. Yeah, inevitably. Even and I still get a. I mean, I love being alone. I obviously have chosen work where I'm alone most of the time. But like, yeah, it's. I mean, we we have to live in community. And if this has taught us anything, it's that you know we are profoundly interdependent, and not just mm-hmm. interdependent on the people in, in our family or or in our town. Like we are in, in interdependent as a species, and there is no there is no walking back from that. And we need to acknowledge, we need to build systems that acknowledge that interdependence and that that don't leave people behind in the profound ways that that we're doing so now. And so I I hope that some, you know, some learning comes out of this, but man, mostly I just want it to be over. This sucks. And I I, I'm also a little tired of the bright siding. Like I'm a little tired of being bright sided about how all the wonderful lessons we're going to learn from the pandemic and all the time we got with our kids. And like, it's great. I love hanging out with my kids and it is great that I've had all this time with my kids and I haven't been on an airplane in eight months and all that's lovely. But like, this is, this sucks. And 270,000 Americans have died and it sucks. And I wish I, I, I I, w- I want to hear more of that narrative. <laughs> like, well, it's that, terrible. That, how horrible? Yeah. Well, that's the thing is yeah. I uh, yesterday we, we did a show and we talked about the most recent numbers and the spike that we've – well, anyone that's been actually like looking at it, like it was expecting. And yeah. it's like it's, it's awesome that we're talking about vaccines, but there's no reason you should expect – anything to get even remotely close to a normal until maybe summer. And that's like with Fauci yeah. being uh, optimistic. Yeah, we, we are going to have big challenges ahead. Um, it is a lot. I I personally find it easier to know how this is going to end. Um, I think that it's an incredible accomplishment to have, you know, full phase three clinical trials and, and a vaccine that's that individually effective. I think that is such good news. My brother made a great video about this where he was like, this is all the ways it could have gone. Mm-hmm. And and the way that it did go is like the first time we've gotten really, really lucky in the last, you know, nine months. And so I, I, I feel really hopeful, but, you know, that hope isn't about the next eight weeks, because I think the next eight weeks are likely going to be very difficult. Like I believe the experts when they say that it's likely going to be very, very difficult, probably the most difficult period that we've had. And now we know how we're going to get out of it. So we just, we just need to work together to make it to that day and, and, and 
you know, and, and you, you don't want, you don't want the, you, a lot of people are going to die, unfortunately, in the next couple of months. And, and, you know, then hopefully, you know, by the end of next year, at some point, hopefully we'll be in a world where very few to no Americans ever die of COVID again. And so we just have to get there. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, I hope we can come together, which admittedly has been really challenging, um, for the last several years, but I hope we can come together and, and work toward that common goal. You and me both, man. But I, uh, I actually kind of on the opposite note of like my parents, I think obviously like when you have kids, they're yours, you, you love them, you know that they're going to grow up. But I think one of the first times I saw my, my oldest who's, uh, who's six now as like, oh, you're definitely going to be a person is a few months into uh, the stay at home, the stay at home orders was still doing teleschool uh, before they opened up to like 10 percent. Um, I thought, like, as long as I keep my shit together, I'm good. And uh, there was this day I came home and I was like just talking to him. And I was like, oh, we're this is like more of a conversation than we would normally have. And he opened up and cried about missing his friends at school. And it mm. was I think it was like the first time that I as far as like. I felt it like I felt the yeah. weight of him as a person and immediately like parental mode kicked into gear of like, okay, I got to like, it, he's not just a bystander in this. Like I got to be there for him. Um, yeah. And so that's, I will say that was the most heartbreaking and to do the thing that you don't like uh, a little bright siding in the sense of like, it put me into gear. Um, yeah. I think, I think it, it, it's the unfortunate thing with anything that's fucking horrible is that it makes you, realize the the importance or what you need to do in your life yeah yes it can definitely help I, I i feel i feel the same way and you know one of the things about being a parent that i don't think i really totally understood until i was a parent is how desperately you want to take pain away from your kids and mm -hmm. how like i i mean i would do anything anything to take pain away from from my kids and when i see them in pain it, it, hurt, it hurts so much it's it's so hard and 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 you you can't because that's part of being a person mm -hmm. like i remember in fact the last time i saw my dad cry i was like 12 years old and i was coming home from like some horrific middle school dance <laughs> Um, which is a, a, a class of social occasion that should be canceled. I think we should bring back 99% of social engagements post COVID, but no more middle school Done. dances. But I came home from this middle school dance and it had been really rough. It had been re I, I had been, you know, kind of targeted, I guess I would say, um, for bullying. And I came home and I was trying to keep it together because I was, you know, 12 or 13 and thought of myself as being a pretty, you know, big kid. And I got to not have emotions and, you know, got to be a, got to be a guy. And like part of, part of the bullying was around this idea that I wasn't masculine anyway. And so like, I was trying to like be, but I, but I just started bawling and my dad asked me what was wrong. And like, I just remember like laying on my bed with him next to me and like hearing him cry and it was such a comfort and consolation to me because I was like, this person really loves me. Mm -hmm. And he loves me all the way down. You know, he loves me in this most vulnerable moment. And that's the gift that I needed not to have the pain taken away from me, not to have it smothered, not to have it like ripped out. And I'm going to call those kids parents and I'm going to fucking destroy him. I didn't need that. What I needed was for him to like hear it and, f and feel it and be able to go there with me. Mm -hmm. And that was, it was one of the greatest gifts of my life. That's wow. That's beautiful. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this episode of a conversation with, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of today's sponsors. Calm. Let's talk about sleep. Most of us want and honestly need more of it. But if you're like me, rather than getting a good night's rest, uh, you might find yourself online, uh, whether it be TikTok, YouTube, whatever, learning something or just watching something when we should really just be powering down for the night. And with the unpredictable and challenging year that 2020 has been, 
we could all benefit from less stress and more sleep in our lives. And that is why I'm excited to partner with Calm. Calm is the app that is designed to help you relieve your anxiety at nighttime so you can stress less and get the best sleep of your life. Seriously, over 85 million people from around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. So why not try it out? Calm has an insanely huge library of programs, which includes hundreds of hours of programming designed for healthy sleep, like uh, soundscapes, guided meditations, and over 100 sleep stories narrated by soothing voices like Stephen Fry, Laura Dern, and even a favorite of mine, Nick Offerman. And for listeners of the show, Calm is offering a special limited time promotion of 40% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash DeFranco. That's 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library and New content is added every single week. So get started today at com.com slash DeFranco. And that's one more time, just in case you missed it, com.com slash DeFranco. With that said, let's get back to the podcast. Normally I'm like, and actually to get to better know you, I have this card game, but I feel like we've actually let's, been doing that. Let's do it. No, no, let's, but we let's, have, no, let, let's go deep with the card game. Okay. So the first one. All right. God, it, it's. It's going to it's going to be you doing have it, I'm asking you to do something that I know that you're going to hate to do which is essentially like talk about why <laughs> you're awesome. What would mm. you say is the secret to your success? Oh. Can I can I can my, I pro- can I project onto you really quick? Yeah, can I tell you what I th- what I actually think yes. is the secret to my success? So like um luck I don't I don't think people talk about luck enough. Luck luck luck. We got so lucky and Hank Hank Hank. <laughs> Those are, those are my two. And then my, my family, my, my, my best friends, like, yeah, I think I, I, I got lucky having really good people around me. And so that's, I think that's been the key. I'll, I'll never discount luck. I think luck and timing is key because there's a lot of really, really fantastic people that never got the opportunity based off of like, I've always had a respect for how smart I think you guys are, but I think even just from having this conversation and And uh, from some of the stuff before we were filming or now, you feel so much like I, uh, are I, you, as far as like someone that, and maybe it's because you can't shield your, your face or your, your emotions. And even after like, obviously you're presenting, you feel to me like one of the most empathetic people. And I don't know if it's the year or just what we've done in general. I feel like we try to close off. I know that dealing with the the negative every day i have to almost like compartmentalize it but you to me see and i don't know if i'm completely wrong it just feels like and maybe that 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 turns into why you can talk about or you can write about hard subjects or such characters that are vulnerable but it it feels like you just feel so much am i wrong there no i think that's i think that's a fair statement and that that can be bad too. Like there's something yeah. about over earnestness that's super cringy, and that also isn't um, authentic emotion. I think um, like it's really Wait. easy for me to fall into over earnestness, um, and so I I'm always trying to find ways in my work, but also in my life to like experience emotion without irony, without the like, you know, shields of cynicism and irony, which I always held up when I was in my twenties, maybe in part because I, you know, I do, I, I, I do have emotionally intense experiences, but like, you, you know, what I, what I, what I learned holding up these shields for so long is that they were, they were ways of trying to trying to protect myself from the reality of experience and from the depth of experience. And, and in that sense, they were, they were wasted uses of my attention because what I really want to be is like alive to the experiences that the, you know, that are, that are out there. And, um, and so, yeah, so I, I have like, and I, I am still trying to, to put down those shields and, and feel things, um, and be open to them and try not to, uh, give in to the there is something about the internet that like specializes in snarky uh, they don't use that word anymore <laughs> that's how old i am but like what used to be called snark and is now just called discourse <laughs> <laughs> like there's something about the internet that like specializes in that and like i i suffer from snark as much as the next person but i do i do try to i, I do try to find ways I am always trying really hard to find a way to engage seriously emotionally with the world around me and to pay attention. Yeah, I uh yeah, the internet has a has its way of bringing out the negative in us. It's it's part of the reason why pe- some people are like why are you so less active on Twitter and I'm like cuz 
because it brings out the worst in me and people fucking yes. cheer me on with like i don't want to yes i don't yes i'm i'm 35 i don't want to destroy someone on the internet and like that's supposed to make me feel better yeah no when i'm on when i'm on even when i, I only use sports twitter now <laughs> i only use my sports twitter but even then you know i somebody recently made a comment on on my sports twitter and they were like you're not very nice here and i was like <laughs> i know i hate I, I hate the way that sports makes me, and then I doubly hate the way that Twitter makes me, and it just turns me into the worst version of myself, and I'm sorry, and I need to I need to do some work. <laughs> I need to figure out what is driving this, because I do. I become a I become a very sore winner, and I, I need to work on that. Uh, that's what you gotta you, you gotta just root for teams that are horrible. That's well, what I, I do. That, I've got that covered, Phil. I'm a, I'm a fan of a third tier English soccer team. So we, uh, is this the team that you, uh, you talked about forever ago and you've like even sponsored them? Yeah. Yeah. We spot, we, 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 uh, our logo is on the liminal space between left thigh and left buttock on the back of their shorts. Not to, not to <laughs> brag, but we do, we have a, uh, we have a, a major sponsorship with a third tier English soccer team who are amazing. They're owned by their fans. I love them. I spend, a lot of my daily waking hours thinking about AFC Wimbledon. Actually, before would you ask me if I have any hobbies? I I guess that is my hobby. I like yeah. to watch third tier English soccer. <laughs> that's that's unique. I was like, my yeah. mine's so generic and brotastic. I'm like, I play fantasy football and I get way too emotionally involved. But I have to play fantasy yeah. sports because, like, once again, oh, the the teams that I root for suck and right so, so the only joy is in this team that you've created yeah like uh for american football and the nfl i'm a i'm a new york jets fan which has just been years and years of That's sadness brutal. yeah brutal. uh this year it's not even just sad it's embarrassing but <laughs> one day a long <laughs> time from day. now after we've ruined yeah. enough uh enough college prospects careers <laughs> we'll do something all right john uh we, we i mean we kind of gushed about your parents but what is something your parents taught you that you now know is wrong? Oh, that's a good question. Gosh. Um, oh, I'm, I, I'm such a, like, uh, such a fanboy of my parents. <laughs> what is something my parents taught me that I now know is wrong? Um, I was like, was there something that was maybe too idealistic? Cause you sound like, you sound like really nice people. Uh, yeah, they're very nice people. Um, No, I can't think of you're like, they nailed it. I feel bad. They're not, they're not perfect people. Like they can be very annoying. Um, but I just don't ever, I, I I can't think of a time when they were out and out wrong. I'm sure they have been, I'm sure sure they've been wrong a bunch of times. Uh, but I can't, I can't, um, I can't think of an example. Um, what is, uh, what's the age difference between you and your brother? You're not, you're not twins, right? No, it's three and a half years. I'm older. Oh, wow. That's like, yeah, so that's okay. So this will actually be helpful for me because um, my boys are split that 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 much. Yeah. How do you get them to do the same things? <laughs> and is it easy oh. after a certain? Because like, one I have one that's six, <laughs> one that's three, right? The three year old's a bully yeah. uh, because he just doesn't yeah. understand boundaries. So he just like right. he manhandles right. Trey, who we've like. I've actually had to be like, if he hurts you in the moment. And I'm not around. You have to hit him. <laughs> yeah. You have to. You can't just, just take uh, it. Just hold him at a distance. Yes. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is very oddly, the little one is just so much stronger. <laughs> yeah. He like bullies him, and so I was like, I'm, I'm saying okay, but if he stops, you can't hit him afterwards. That's not the same thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, a, not, yeah, I'm, so not, gonna I'm not going to win any parents. I'm not going to win any parenting awards doing this. I just. Uh, Oh, there's no, I don't, I, I don't know the right way. Nobody knows the right way. I'm very suspicious of anybody who thinks they know the like one right way to parent children Yeah, because it's, it, my experience has been that it's so, who the frick knows? I, I, I don't know from minute to minute whether I am being a good parent or a horrible one. Yeah. Um, but as for when they, uh, start to like get along and do the same stuff, I mean, <laughs> mid twenties. <20s? laughs> <laughs> so you guys weren't you got you were, weren't close growing up it was just too much of a difference well we i mean we 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 were close we hung out i i like tank he was but it was he was, he was there he was significantly younger than me and mm-hmm. so i didn't think of him as a peer really and then i remember like 
and then I also went to boarding school when he was 11. So like okay. I didn't know him as a teenager. I thought he would like when I would come home from boarding school, I was like, this kid is like a pretty cool teenager. He's like <laughs> pretty goth and he goes to like Denny's late night. He doesn't drink alcohol, but he goes to like Denny's late at night and drinks coffee. And I, I kind of I liked him. I thought he was like a cool, weird kid. But it wasn't until we really like he got to college and especially like after I graduated from college and was completely floundering that suddenly I was like, God, this guy's really smart and like lots of interesting ideas. And that's that's where we started to get closer. So okay. it, I, I regret to say it did take a while. <laughs> you're like, so you're screwed. Good, good, good. Noted. Yeah. No, you're not screwed. You just screwed for like 15 years. Yeah. No, I mean, right now we got uh, out of nowhere, the six year old. Uh, can ride a bike without training wheels which was like oh that's awesome which i was like yes uh, that's an amazing and, that's, a, that's such a great day yeah and he and he hit that right at the same time as a three-year-old finally understood a scooter and i was like okay we got one thing i'm gonna lean into this hard yeah i'm leaning into this hard movement <laughs> it's helpful for <laughs> me great. too um this is this i wonder if you have an answer for this what is uh what's your biggest regret Oh, you know, there's all those people who say like, I don't, I don't regret anything because it all got me to where I am. Hate that and answer. I'm so happy with how it, I, I regret, almost, I regret, I have so many regrets. Um, and in fact, like I'm not ever allowed to forget them because every night when I, when I lay my head down on the pillow, my brain is like, um, it like clears its throat and, and says like, shall, shall we play the blooper reel? <laughs> uh, but so it's so it, so what's hard is finding the biggest regret rather mm. than finding a regret. Um, you know, I I, uh, I I I guess for I guess probably. You know, honestly, like the biggest regret I have is that when the Fault in Our Stars movie was being filmed, my daughter was very very young. She was like, I think I left when she was like eleven weeks old, and. I was on the set most of the time and I wish I had gone back more often because that time of life is so challenging for parents, one, but also it's like a really important developmental time for kids. And, you know, I was gone like five or six days a week and I, and I, and I could have been gone three or four days a week and really helped, helped out more. So I, I guess I would say that. That's a solid one. Yeah, I uh, I was like, the only thing that I, I, I don't, as a parent, I, I don't think about the development so much as I, very selfishly. I'm just like, I'm never going to, like my kid, I don't know when they're going to stop wanting to cuddle. <laughs> like, so yeah. that, that's, that's, I'm just in it for cuddles <laughs> and attention. Yeah, I know. I, we, we I'm still there, thankfully. Yeah. But yeah, someday they're going to be like, yeah, I mean, and then they never... You know, you never cuddle with them again. Um, the relationship just changes because they become adolescents and they've got to partly, you know, that's developmentally appropriate. They got to like start to think about themselves separate from you. And it's, a, but boy, it's going to be a sad day in the green household when that comes. Well, I was going to say in the green household, when do kids get social media? Oh, no, not, not yet. I, mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we got a, we got a 10 year old and a seven year old. And I guess the answer is not, not yet. yet. I was like, I'm literally, I'm just going to look to you. Cause I have, li I have no idea. I, I mean, I, I also, I have no idea. And you know, some of Henry's friends have like YouTube accounts or, uh, or Instagram accounts and it's harmless for them because it's just them, you know, talking to each other. It's not a lot of like public interaction, but I do worry a little bit with Henry that, or, or Alice, that if they had public media, pub, pu kind of public social accounts that they might have people coming in who just, who aren't just like friends from school. And mm -hmm. I, that would not, I'm not into that. Yeah. I don't know what that, that whole environment is like where everyone has followers in, in like middle and high <sighs> school now. Yeah. It's just like a whole different layer because I don't like, I don't yeah. have to deal with that with other parents. Like other people just have jobs. <laughs> Maybe some people have like Instagram accounts for like a business that they do, but it's not, yeah. it was never uh, connected to my worth as a, as a kid. Oh, for sure. No, I mean it, it, and I didn't have any sense of, I didn't have any sense that any of that was even possible. Like growing up in Orlando, like it never crossed my mind that somebody could be influential outside of their school, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, 
it was impossible enough to imagine being influential in school, <laughs> let alone, you know, having a, but yeah, there are a lot of teenagers and uh, who have big Instagram followings and for whom Instagram or Snapchat or whatever are important ways of communicating with, um, with their friends, but also, you know, with trying to build a community and, I, I feel totally unqualified to comment on that because I was, you know, 27, 28 years old when I got a YouTube account. Right. So what do I know? I don't know what it's like to be 17 and have Twitter. You've actually helped me easily segue into this next question. John, if we went to high school together, would we have been friends? Why or why not? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, wa I, wonder, I wonder if we would have been friends, even though we would have run in somewhat different circles. Yeah, my circle is no if circle. <laughs> Yeah, I, to be clear, I didn't run in a lot of circles, <laughs> mostly. Uh, yeah, but I, I think we, I mean, I think we, I think we probably would have been friendly and might have been friends because I feel like a lot of, yeah, I do, I do. Well, I don't know. What do you think? I think now, yes. I think at different times over the last 14 years, maybe not because I've been different levels of asshole. Like there's understandable so levels. Yeah. And that's the thing is so, but I think now, yeah, but I think, I, <laughs> but it's weird. Cause it's like, I think it comes from a place of like mute. I, I think mutual respect and like yeah. uh, perceived understandings of, of each other rather than, cause I'm trying to think of like who I was. I didn't have I, my personality in, in high school was like, I just want someone to be my friend. <laughs> and so I was just very, I was a very right. agreeable human being. That's all I really was then. Yeah, I, I think there was an element of that for me. Um, I did have really good friendships in high school, especially after I went to boarding school. And that was a great gift and, you know, really important for me. Um, but I also had, just because it was such a small, insular place, I, you know, I was friends with people who were very different from me in lots of different ways. And none of that seemed insurmountable to friendship because we you know, we're like forced to inhabit the same 10 acres to, together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I feel like if you'd been there, uh, we would have we would have gotten along. OK, I love that. Hey, just me interrupting my own podcast again for a quick sponsor shout out for my buddies over at Squarespace. If you didn't already know, Squarespace empowers people of all kinds to create their online web presence or launch their passion projects. And it's a place that so many people trust and where everyone can find and make a home. And it's easy to see why there is nothing to install, patch or upgrade ever. And creating a beautiful website with Squarespace's all in one platform has never been so simple. It is extremely intuitive and easy to use. Also, it includes fantastic things that usually don't think about until way after things like gaining access to their award-winning marketing tools and analytics and you can get personalized support from their award-winning customer care team via email or live chat whatever you need they are available 24 7 to help out so if you want to check it out see why so many people love it you want to start your free trial today just head on over to squarespace.com acw and when not if you realize you love it make sure you enter an offer code acw to get 10 percent off your first purchase but with that said back to the podcast um John, describe the first time that your perspective changed significantly on something. Yeah, it's interesting. That's an interesting question, though. I mean, there's been a bunch of times when my perspective on really important things have changed and things that I thought I had a complete understanding of. It turns out I didn't. Like, one that comes to mind is reading uh, this, this book. It's a textbook, actually. It's called An Introduction to Global Health Delivery by hmm. Dr. Joya Mukherjee, in which I found out that because of the World Bank and IMF policies in the 1980s and 1990s, or mostly in the 80s, I think, a lot of impoverished countries were only able to spend about 5 to $10 per person per year on their healthcare systems. So they're only allowed to spend like 5% of GDP on their healthcare systems. And mm. because they were so poor, that was like $5. And so in this period when healthcare systems were getting stronger around the world, the, this set of, you know, deeply impoverished countries was, was not only unable to like keep up, but they were unable to fund even a, like a basic healthcare system. Understanding that like poor countries, and that's just one of example of many, many examples of, of 
that that poor countries are not poor because it is preordained or because there is some failure of governance or because of this or because of that. Like p- poor countries are poor because of historical circumstances that are being lived out in the present. And understanding that really changed my life quite dramatically because it led to my brother and and me rethinking the way that we were donating money and and thinking about how you know how we needed to a donate a lot more and b kind of work with with larger groups of people to try to really build really help the people who are building up healthcare systems in those countries because because this is such a deeply interdependent planet we just can't have it's not it's not right it's not just but it's also it's just also not a, a good idea like we just can't have a, a situation where you know a billion or a billion and a half people don't have access to primary health care so reading that book uh most expensive book I ever read for sure um but 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 changed my life a lot how many books are you still reading a year yeah I mean uh 2020 hasn't been great for my reading Phil I don't know how it's been for yours um <laughs> I was like I prob- I was like, I've just Probably. switched to audiobooks this year. Yeah, I've I've definitely listened to a lot of audiobooks while I'm doing the dishes and doing the yeah. laundry and stuff, which is great. I mean, honestly, like right now, like I don't know, this year doing the laundry has not really been a chore <laughs> so much as it's been a gift because it's like quiet time where yeah. no one is asking me for anything <laughs> and like I can <laughs> listen to an audiobook and it's lovely. Um I probably list, I I probably listen or read to well, I don't know, like the, uh, 30 or 40 books this year, which is w- well down from where I would like to be. But it just, it's been a weird year. I like that 40, you're just like, ah, rookie numbers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I used to read a, a lot. Are you talking about like 80, 100 or? <laughs> well, I used to, so when I first got out of college, I worked for a magazine that was a book review journal for like six years. And I reviewed a lot, hundreds and hundreds of books for, uh-huh. for book lists. So I, I mean, in those years, like before my first novel came out, I was reading 200 or 300 books a year, which was an incredible, incredible apprenticeship, you know, to be able to read really broadly, you know, a huge selection of books that are currently being published really. I mean, that's the reason I be- was able to become a writer was mm-hmm. because I had this, you know, huge body of work that I was reading that was coming into my brain and that I could respond to with my own stories. Did, uh, it was a little out of nowhere, uh, for, did Hank come to you first when he said, Hey, I want to try and write uh, a novel? Not really. Um, I mean, we would talk about it sometimes. Like I knew he was, I knew he was writing a story and I, and we would talk about it sometimes. Like I remember one time we were playing ping pong and he was like, kind of pitching me the premise of the story. And I was like, yeah, I mean, yeah, it sounds cool. But like all premises sound cool, Hank. Like the work is, <laughs> the work is in writing it down, you know, yeah. like it's not, it's not that hard to come up with like wizard school. Like the work is, <laughs> you know, or like uh, vampires in love. Like the work is in making the story. Right. And 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 so we would have a few conversations like that, but I didn't see a single page of Hank's book until it was finished. And I, I think he just, just didn't want to uh, show it to me until he was ready. And I loved it. Oh, I was really, I've never been that nervous to read a book in my life. Right. I, I, mean, I, I wasn't was, even that. I was going to ask. I was obviously you're going to yeah. say that you loved it, but I was, I was like. <laughs> yeah, but I did. I did. I mean, I, I, I was almost that nervous to read my wife's book, mm-hmm. but. I mean, I've read I've read a lot of Sarah's writing, so I, I felt comfortable with it. I knew I knew I was going to like it. With Hank's, I mean, I'd never read a word of Hank writing fiction in my life, not even when we were kids, and so I was really nervous. And I and for like the first fifty pages, I was I I, I kept like I was so in my head about like, is this good? Is this going to work? How's this going to pay off? And then there was this like almost like this moment where everything clicked in and I was like not reading it as Hank's brother anymore. I was just reading it as a novel and I was, and I was like, Oh my God, this is fun and it's good. And it's so smart about the internet. Like it understands Hank understands the internet in a way that I don't. 
and like he's explaining to me what the water that I've been swimming in for the last 10 years is made out of. That's how it felt to me. Yeah, what, 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 it, what, was, it was so, uh, oh man, I was, I, so I don't want to turn this into a promo for Hank's book, God knows, but like, I just thought it was incredible. No, and it's very rare that I feel like you come up with a sequel and it's still solid. It's I, still just as good. Yeah, I uh, not to not to do that thing where you you shit on something else to praise something else, but I'm I'm about done with Ready Player Two and it gave me <laughs> greater appreciation for Hank's second book. I, well, I have not I have not read uh, either of those books, so I don't feel qualified to comment. But on my on personal the Hank experience, front, my personal experience on the on the Hank front, I just thought both of those books. Yeah, it's it's so much pressure. I mean, uh, writing a sequel, it, it's hard to even understand from the outside. I mean, I've never had to write a sequel, but I have had to like follow up a book that was very successful. And obviously, it's a great kind of pressure to have. I've had other kinds of pressure in my career, like about am I going to make enough money from this book to pay the rent? And that is a lot more stressful. And I, I don't want to pretend otherwise. But Asking somebody to follow up a, a book that was very successful and that had a big place in people's lives is a is also a lot of pressure. It's really difficult. There are a lot of like publishing jobs on the line in some cases, and it's scary. And I I think Hank just handled that so well. And the book is so I mean, it's more ambitious than the first book, and mm -hmm. and it's super fun while still being just uh, the best commentary on contemporary internet experience I've ever read. I. I love it. I I can't. I I couldn't believe that he wrote it. Like I, it's so weird because you know we've all read YouTuber books, and some of them are great. But I I kind of felt like I was re you know going to be reading a YouTuber book, and I was like, oh, I hope this is a good YouTuber book, and um, and it just yeah, I just could not believe that my little brother wrote that book. Well, yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine the pressure. Like he had to knock it out of the park, otherwise everything else would probably be seen in some degree as a failure. Because I mean, that's the unfortunate thing, right? Is you are yeah. he, he has his brother that has this track record, and then and it's like, oh, so yeah. you think you can write too? And I mean, I talked to him too. One to to your same point, it felt like someone actually finally understood the internet <laughs> that was writing about it. Uh, and two, yeah, just there was a lot of stuff in there that. But like uh, I said to him, as far as like uh, was it April, uh, like her dealing with the uh, the the attention and the power of the position, and not yes. just becoming another peg. And I was like, ugh, like it that and honestly that book and going to see Hamilton and then just listening to the soundtrack over and over had like a actual impact on me and what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. It's wild. Hey, just taking a quick break from the podcast to shout out one of the sponsors of today's episode of A Conversation With Caviar. You know, to be honest, 2020 has been a lot and sometimes cooking at the end of a long day just, it seems exhausting. It's too much sometimes. Whether it be a late Friday night when you just want to relax or a busy Monday after a lot of work where you just want your day to be a little easier, Caviar has got you covered. You just download the app and you get local restaurants delivered right to you. And Caviar is all about great restaurants. And that's why you'll find the best spots in your neighborhood right when you open the app. And in fact, the best part is that they have local teams dedicated to finding the best food in your city so you do not miss out. And with these local collections specialized by these amazing teams, it is super easy to find good food in your own neighborhood for whatever you are feeling. And caviar isn't just for weeknight dinners. They can also help you get ice cream, random late night munchie cravings, a quick lunch or a smoothie, and so much more. So yeah, whether it be pizza, sushi, dim sum, falafel, whatever food, you get the point. Whatever you are in the mood for, Caviar is the app for you. Get it. Get the Caviar app, get delivery, get the food you want. And just for our listeners, Caviar is giving you 20% off your first order. You just enter in promo code Phil at checkout and boom. So just remember that is 20% off your first order with promo code Phil. One final time, just in case, download the Caviar app, use offer code Phil for 20% off your first order. But with that said, back to the podcast. <laughs> now, that, now that we've just hyped Hank up, which I love that. Yeah. I love that you, you have him in your background too. The pride there. I do. I do. Yeah. And it, I mean, honestly, I, was like, I don't even see any you, of your books, it, if, but it's boom, I yours. I don't think any of them are up there, but it, it, I've, I've, I've done okay. If, if you, if you buy one book from this interview, it should really be Hank's book, An Absolutely Remarkable Thing and the sequel, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor. I was telling him, uh, I, I, I want, now that you have the, uh, you have your movie, I want that to be a series. I was like, I do too. A limited series I, would be dope. I, I think it'd be amazing. Like, like a great, you know, Netflix, HBO, mm -hmm. 15 episode arc could be amazing. So with you being the, uh, the, the very proud older brother, uh, let's go negative. What's your greatest fear about getting older? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you know, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of fears about, um, like pr- professional stuff or anything. I mean, my greatest fear with getting older would be being in a situation where I can't take care of our kids the way that I, I, I want to, um, yeah, my, my, I mean, my greatest fear, to, to be honest, like my greatest fear about getting older is is experiencing dementia. It, that, mm. I've I've loved a lot of people who've who've gone through dementia, and it's just really really difficult, and um, it's not something that I would wish on on anyone. Oof. That was too real, John. <laughs> yeah, so I, I I I mean, I wish I could be like, oh, it's my I'm worried no, that like, I, my knee's going to get creaky, but I don't really. I worry that my brain's going to stop working. Yeah. I don't, I have nothing to, I'm trying to think of what to add to that, but I just also have that same fear. <laughs> but my, yeah, my fear is, yeah. I feel like more unfounded. Mine's like, I'm just, I've always been a forgetful person, which is a completely different thing. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, no, but I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, well, and plus I'm, I know that I've always been pretty forgetful. Yeah, exactly. Um, so it's but, like, it's like yeah. the, uh, when you, when you experience allergies now, you're like, is it the worst case scenario? No. Okay. It's just allergies. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yes. It's very hard to have a runny nose in 2020. Well, you, and, you, you, uh, you not, also just can't cough. <laughs> you can't drink can't your cough, water. Can't cough in public for sure. Done. You cannot. Yeah. Just leave the establishment. Even like, even when Sarah and I are like watching a TV show or something and it's like 10 o'clock and she coughs a little, I'm like, (laughs) it's hard, it's hard not to because I, you know, I really don't. Yeah. It's just, it's, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people recover really quickly and really well and, um, that's great. And, and, uh, but you know, it's unpredictable. Yeah. John, how do you uh how do you deal with conflict? I've only seen you in one uncomfortable slash bad situation in my life, but how do you how do you how do you deal with conflict? Not not brilliantly. Um I Also, do you know do you, you remember what I'm talking about? I don't. I was like, "Wait, what? What did I how did I handle it?" You tell me how I handled it. Uh, it was, I forget which VidCon it was. Um, it was, was back when I, I knew it. Was, of course it was VidCon. <laughs> oh no, the, the, the anger already there. No, no, uh, no, no. I, oh, it's great. It's, um, I'm, SourceFed was, I, I forget what year it was in. It was still around. Oh, I know what you're going to say. It was, uh, Kyle that, Mooney. that, uh, yeah, that, that like comedian got on stage and like, he's on SNL now. Is he really? Yeah, he's like a he's a he's a oh. staple now. But I remember he, he wasn't he wasn't funny that day. <laughs> well, yeah, I forget. Do you remember what he did? I remember something he was showing. He showed something on screen, and yeah, the crowd and, like, booed. Made a sort of like misogynistic a series of misogynistic jokes, and there were a lot of you know young people kids in the audience. And I mean, this is my memory of it. I I don't know, but like my memory of it is is that he got up there and made a series of misogynistic jokes, which didn't go over well. Um, and he got he got booed. Um, and then, yeah, like afterwards there was, you know, because I think that I don't remember the, the details I, of it, but afterwards there was, a a conflict and I actually thought I, hand, I actually thought I handled that one pretty well. Like I felt pretty strongly about my position. Well, it was one of the um, moments where I just saw you like kick into gear. You're like, we have to do something now. And I think yeah. his mic ended up getting cut off, but I, <laughs> I didn't know how to handle any anything of what was happening because we had just been talking. And so I just yeah. started laughing. And then I started laughing more because I was so nervous. I was like, why am I laughing? And I couldn't stop. And that's the only memory I have of it. Oh, I, yeah. I, that was stressful. I... I, I I had I had mostly forgotten about that. Um I, I and you know, of course, um you know, such is life, but I, I can't imagine I how thought, stressful just ha- throwing that event is though. I mean, I totally get why you guys ended up yeah. uh getting acquired or selling or wh- whatever the terminology is yeah. there because I just that's so much. It's too many people and there's it's always going to there's going to be something negative no matter what. That's the unfortunate thing. Yeah, it it got to be too big for us, you know, and it got to be too big for us to, um, to, to handle on our own, uh, both like literally, um, you know, there was too much on the line, too many people's jobs on the line and all that stuff. But also, um, you know, it was, a, it was a lot to handle emotionally at times because it is, yeah, you, so much of the, that year was built around making sure those three days went well. 
I still love VidCon and I and I still love going to VidCon and I hope that VidCon is back soon and I can go again. But um but I I don't I don't miss that level of like having to make the big difficult decisions. Um in general, I think that I in general, I think I try to handle conflict by having a quick conversation because it's when it festers that it becomes a big problem for me. Um, but I don't always, I don't always do a great job of it. Yeah. I feel like, uh, the quickness is good. Yeah. My, my main thing as far as my conflicts these days are just like, there's an issue for, for the show or there's an issue for, one of the other companies that we're trying to run. And I'm just like, just don't, Mm -hmm. don't give me the reasons why it's not going to work. Just solutions. I was like, that's it. I don't even care if it's a bad solution. (laughs) Just like it's a prospect. That's the, I feel other than that, I don't really bump heads with anyone. I don't have conflict. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's some of it, some of it is inevitable. Um, but the truth is like, and I, I mean, I, I guess that anybody would say this, but I feel like it's true. Like we, we get along really, really well in our, in our, company and we all believe in what we're doing and we share that vision. And, um, and so we don't have a lot, the, the conflicts are really in a good spirit in the sense that we all know, first off, we all know that we value each other and, and understand that each person who works on the show is valuable. But also like, I I think that we understand that when we're discussing w- which way to go, we're all doing it with the same value set in mind and the same goal in mind. And I think if you have that sense of mission, that sense of values, um, then it's a lot easier. Um, I know we, we, you know, we, in the first 10 minutes, we, we mentioned your, your new book, but what, what, what is it and when is it coming out again? So I have for the last three years been making a podcast with WNYC called The Anthropocene Reviewed, where I write like um, absurdly in-depth Yelp reviews of um, facets of the human-centered planet like uh, cholera or the Taco Bell breakfast menu or um, this uh, th- these cave paintings <laughs> at, uh, at Lascaux in France or the board game Monopoly. Uh, it's, it's a huge variety of topics, yeah. but, um, but it's a, it's a book of essays. And so now it's being turned into a, a book of essays that comes out next May. Um, the podcast has been one of the, the greatest professional joys of my life, just because I've been able to work with such amazing people. The sound designers are just like brilliant. And I always kind of looked up when I was younger to the work that WNYC was doing in places like radio lab and podcasts like Nancy and, uh, more recently podcasts like Nancy. And so it's just like a dream project for me. I got to work with Stan who co-founded Crash Course and with Rosiana, who's been my production partner forever. So it's just a wonderful chance to make stuff together with people I really like. And then now the essays um, are being adapted into a book, which has been really fun to work on. And when, when's it going to be out? It comes out in May. Okay. So we got, you got some runway. <laughs> you got a little bit of time. You got, don't let that discourage you from pre-ordering now. Right now. But you do, ha- you do have some time. How did, uh, how did that come about? Like what, who, 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 who came up with it? Uh, I started writing them and then I took them to Rosiana and Stan and I said, I've written these two reviews of, I wrote a review of Diet Dr. Pepper and one of Canada geese, like the animal. And they read them and they were like, these are very weird and particular. And Stan uh, and Rosiana both liked them and they were like, but it shouldn't be a YouTube series. It should just be a podcast because it's more intimate. And and they are, even though they're like reviews about Diet Dr. Pepper, they're really about me. I mean, it's really a memoir and attempt to kind of like chart um, so you, how it's been f- for me. Um, so, you, so you just use these, t- do you feel like you use these topics as just like the jumping off point? Totally. Okay. Yeah. So talking about Canada geese is really a way to talk about how um, we think of Canada geese as being everywhere and as being ubiquitous. And um, but in fact, like they were almost extinct just 70 years ago and and almost everything that we think of as being everywhere and ubiquitous and inevitable and natural from, you know, manicured front lawns to soccer games to, you know, driving to work. All of that stuff is is a really recent innovation in human history. And so it's about me trying to grapple with, um, 
I guess trying to zoom in and zoom out on on my life and try to understand like when I take my kids to soccer practice or more properly when I took my kids to soccer practice and it feels like I have to do all of these things or like I have to mow the lawn because it is natural to have a lawn. Like, is it? Do I? And what might I do instead? Oh, I like that. It sounds like it's a uh, it's it's maybe giving people accessibility to to emotions based off of you know random life experiences. That's that's basically the the shtick of it. I trick you into thinking I'm going to be talking about Dr Pepper, and then actually I'm talking about um you know something from my own something personal from my own life. So based off of these experiences that you've had, obviously this one's more it's newer and fresher. Do you have a preference based off of trying to to go through the the mindset of what's normally a, a female protagonist versus yourself? Is there a difference? Yeah, in- I mean this is the first time I mean I've written books both from both the perspective of boys and and girls, but I've always written both about people who are very different from me, but also for people who are very different from me, because I was always an adult um, writing, trying to write, a, you know, for teenagers and and trying to to write about teenage experience. And so, part I, I think part of why I liked that was because I wasn't writing for myself. Like writing to me feels a little. Um, self-indulgent when it's about me or when I'm making it about me or even when I'm making it for me. And so I wanted to make it for a different group of people. And and, and partly, I think, because I loved the books I read as teen as, as a teenager so much. And they were they 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 remain so important in my life. And um and so I I think that's also what what drew me to that. But I think a big part of it was like not writing about myself. And even when I was writing stuff that was semi-autobiographical, like I always felt like there was a lot of distance. And this time there is no distance. And that has been scary in some ways and and intimidating in some ways. But it's also been um, thrilling to use that, that Gertrude Stein word. Because it's it feels like I'm doing something very different and I'm doing something that's that's harder and I'm trying to be honest. Like I'm trying to be honest about not what it's like to be, you know, Miles Halter at a boarding school in Alabama, but like what it's like to be me, this adult who lives in Indianapolis and has a family. And I'm sure, I mean, I don't know if it comes into the into the process or the mindset of when you when you kind of start from some, something like this, but do you feel a little more comfortable in it because you know that, I mean, over the last 10, 15 years, your audience has also probably grown up. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, even with with The Fault in Our Stars and Turtles All the Way Down, my mo- my two most recent books, like I, I think most of the readers of those books were adults. Right. I think that, that that's just kind of how the audience changed, but also maybe those books were a little bit different from my previous books. I don't really know. Maybe I was older. I don't know. What, I don't know what caused it, but but it, they both had really broad adult readerships, which was cool and 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 gratifying. Um, you know that that it resonated with with lots of different kinds of people. But I think for me, the biggest difference is not actually whether I'm writing about teenagers. It's about whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction. So when I'm writing fiction, I feel a level of protection. Um, on a lot of levels, you know, like I'm allowed to make stuff up. I can't, I can't get in trouble for that. That's not against the rules. Um, but also I'm allowed to, uh, it's, yeah, it's just not about me. And so I don't have to worry about somebody, um, you know, uh, saying something mean about me that I gave them ammunition for by talking about myself. And when you're writing nonfiction, you do have to do that. Um, and you do have to you do have to like be able to make yourself vulnerable in that way and and that was a lot of the work and that is a lot of the work of writing this is is the work of trying to be trying to like put aside those desires to protect myself or trying to put aside those desires to have cool people think I'm cool or the people I think are cool think I'm cool or whatever. Yeah. And just try to try to speak as directly as I can about the emotional experiences that have mattered to me. And so once once this this comes out, right? And you, you finish signing the pages, everyone gets the book and uh the reviews happen and all that. For you, because you you have you have released so much work at this point, 
what what is that is there downtime for you i mean i know that like we even started with the fact that you you and hank have so many jobs uh but yeah. do you like how do how do you rest your brain before thinking okay i'm gonna try and create not even pump something else out like uh, genuinely like create this this other entirely new baby <laughs> there's more downtime for me than i think there is for most people yeah. you know like i'm able to have a uh, a, a tremendous amount of flexibility in my work. And so even though there's a lot of stuff that has to happen every week, that when it happens is some of when it happens is up to me. And so, you know, I, I often think that I, I, I remember the six years when I worked nine to five, Monday to Friday, like it was, it was an, a huge amount of work to like go to the bank. It's a huge amount of work to like do any kind of normal, just, activity, any kind of errand, because all the other people were also doing errands then. And now I can go and now I can do an errand at two o'clock, not every day, but not every day, but some days. And that's been, yeah, I mean, that's a real gift. And I try not to lose sight of it. I love it. Sup, you beautiful bastards. Let's take one last sponsor break to thank the sponsor and friend of the show, Vessi. You know, it is hard to find lightweight shoes that actually keep your feet warm and dry through rain, snow, mud, and Vessi definitely surprised me with these. Vessi makes 100% waterproof and snowproof sneakers that are incredibly comfortable, breathable, and actually pretty stylish. Definitely better than some clunky snowshoes, trust me. And personally, I wear both their Cityscape sneakers and their latest weekend shoe, in part because their Dymatex material is a dual climate knit, which keeps you cool in the summer and warm in the winter, which truly makes this the everyday sneaker, even for the upcoming wet season. These shoes are perfect whether you're running errands, going to the gym, going to the park with the kids, maybe you're going on muddy hikes, just rinse the shoes off, throw them in the washing machine. It is that easy. And be sure to check out their incredible holiday offer right now and grab yourself a pair for the rainy season while they still have your size. You can thank me later. Just head on over to Vessi.com slash Franco. And if you end up missing the sale, do not worry. You can still use code DeFranco at checkout to get $25 off. So yeah, thank you. You're welcome. And back to the podcast. I think, uh, John, the way that I'm going to close this out, because it's been 90 minutes of me picking your brain, but I think, you know, you're the kind of guy that ask questions about people and the world. Do you have any questions for me? Um, I mean, they're all, they're all going to, I, I have a couple questions for you. One, like less personal sure. and one more personal. Love it. So when you look back, you're one of the very few people who have been doing this as long as Hank and I have. And, and so you're one of the very few people who has like that that longitudinal sense that allows you to maybe look into the future differently, um, not necessarily more accurately, but right. differently. I wonder what you feel like, whether you're optimistic about social internet discourse over the next five years, are we going to turn a corner and find ourselves in a better place together? Or, or, or do you think things are just kind of going to continue to get worse. I, I I really hate to be negative. I uh I I do I mean I don't I don't know how much you've you've tracked me over the years because uh I think I've changed my tune to it. Uh, I think that the, the like social media in general is one of the biggest threats uh to our future. Um yeah, the, I agree. The, the last few years I think have really highlighted that. Um anyone that thinks like once it becomes 2021 or there's a an official change of administration on January 20th that all of a sudden like <laughs> a number of things will change. But one of the things that I do not think will change is uh, the, the, the damage that is going to happen via social media just because uh, it's it's a, I, I, I don't I can't think of a solution. I genuinely can't think of a solution that that makes that it that works um it's yeah a, a andrew yang i think kind of explained it i mean it's been a long understood thing that uh you know a lie spread so much faster but it's like it's like you're it's like you're playing a game I, andrew yang said it better and so i'm going to paraphrase it weekly but it's like you're playing a sport and every time you score it's one and every time the other team scores it's six um and it's it's like you're playing that this 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 game that feels unwinnable and i don't know <laughs> i don't know what makes it winnable uh emotions emotions have taken over echo chambers uh have taken over i, I don't i don't foresee it getting better we're, we're not we're not jumping off from the same 
facts. It's we're not jumping off from the same reality. And so there's no reason to expect that the end results of that equation is even remotely the same. Yeah. X is different. <laughs> that's that's the way I'll put it. X is different. Uh yeah. I mean that's that's my concern as well that we look I, I look at the architecture and it seems like so much of what's been really bad for civil discourse, not just in the United States. I mean, you can look at, you know, the, the, the rise of populism in Brazil, you can look at wars and, and at physical violence that, that has happened as a result of this ability of misinformation to spread really, really quickly and to justify, you know, ethnic hatreds or to justify, um, you know, all, all kinds of attacks. I don't see how you I don't see how you can have the same architecture that we have on like Twitter or Facebook or Reddit and and not have the same outcome because they just val their business model is to value engagement and to uh, their business model is is to grab grab and hold your attention and then monetize that attention and what holds your attention most is when you are afraid it's when you're outraged it's when you're scared it's when you're like occasionally um given a little giggle and that's what they they are really really good at that like they have the, you know they have done this incredible job of that um so much so that like it can be very enjoyable it still can be very enjoyable to be on twitter it's just that like afterwards i feel worse not unlike other things that i've been addicted to you know like uh so i uh, yeah i was kind of hoping that you were going to uh turn the corner for me a little bit if you look distantly into the future but i guess not which is fine because i feel the same way no there's yeah there's this i think there's this belief that because things have always been okay and i use that because it's not been okay for a large number of people but right yeah. things will, will always that things will always be okay but it's like no there's there's nothing that makes yeah. me as a human being because of like where i was born immune to what has worked elsewhere that, that's just not the case yeah and i i think yeah. that's my fear and i think that uh if anything we're buying ourselves some time in the next few years uh but i don't i I don't know. I, I I don't. I'm not looking at it with rose color, colored glasses. I'm I'm really nervous about like what the the next four to eight years look like. Yeah, yeah. I was in a meeting once with a high level executive at a one of those companies, and I said the you know the problem is in the architecture. It's in the way that um, it's in it's in what kinds of responses uh, filter to the top. And they were like, but the responses that filter to the top are the ones that get the most engagement. And I was like, yes, that that is the problem. <laughs> that's the problem with architecture. You have to make that go away. And they were like, but that's how people stay on the site. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm, I guess I, I guess I'm in that like scene in Jerry Maguire where I'm like, fewer clients, less money. That's the key. So I don't know. I'm I'm concerned. I I worry. I worry that we are making it worse by participating in it, and um, uh, and it's a source of worry for me. Second question, mm -hmm. more personal question. Mm -hmm. uh, in this 14 years, you have also gone through so many changes in your life. You weren't married when you started making YouTube videos. You weren't a father. Uh, your, your relationship, I think it's safe to say, um, with the rest of your family was, was very different. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if, if you feel like there are things that you have learned from the public part of your life that have informed those relationships and helped you to, because so often we hear about like, you know, social media influencers being, you know, exploitative parents or stage mm -hmm. parents or whatever. And like, I've, I have been very impressed, I have to say, with the, with the way that, that you and Linz have, um, you know, taken care of your kids and, um, and, and focused on them, uh, and, you know, like included them in your work, uh, without making, making, your work about them. Sure. Um, and so I wonder if there, yeah, if there's anything that you feel like you've learned in your public life that's applied to those, those family relationships. Um, I will say, I think the, the last 14 years have made me a more empathetic and sensitive person. Uh, unfortunately it's because 
of I would say like negative moments online of being mm, being able to see yeah. the because I, when I came online, I think uh, like a lot of young people, I came on very very judgmental and angry, um, and I, I think I don't know. You see, you see enough people make mistakes that didn't come from like a bad place, and you're like, ah, oh, fuck, did I <laughs> did I go too far? Um, you you experience what it's like to be on the other thing, right? You do anything online uh, long enough, people get angry that you you did something or maybe something got misconstrued and you understand like that. So I feel like it made me a more empathetic, sensitive person. Um, and as far as, I mean, as, as far as like the family and, and lens, I feel like it made me realize that I don't, I don't need to share everything. Like when I asked you earlier, like, what do you have outside that you like, that's a hobby or something you enjoy that you don't monetize? Um, it's because, you know, coming up, I tried to monetize anything I could. Yeah. Like I daily vlogged while I was uh, making videos where, where I was like, I'm moving and I'm, you know, this 22 year old blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I like, I was like, oh, I should monetize playing video games and I'll live stream it and turn that into video on blah. And I, I like watching movies. I'm going to make reviews. So I was like figuring out a way to monetize uh, everything I do. And then it took the joy out of it and it made me realize because I was very, I was very much raised. Uh, it, it's always going to sound like I'm putting shit on my parents, but I was raised that like I didn't have a lot of money growing up, and it's like how you how you gauge your success was money, right? And mm -hmm. so I was like, I have to turn everything into money. Um, and you know, you hit different levels of success, and you you realize like, oh, this it just stops making you feel a certain way. You need someone in your life or people in your life that make you still appreciate how fucking blessed you are and how lucky you are that you don't have to worry about rent every month like you used to and like all this stuff that um is like that that kind of ties you down and and reminds you that <laughs> you're bitching about something that isn't a problem for 99 percent of people um but but yeah, I think it's just appreciating experiences. I, d I never really appreciated experiences. And I thought that the only thing I could get joy out of was work uh, and mm. which ultimately tied into people giving me praise. Um, the best thing about selling my fucking company uh, was it seven years or eight years ago at this point is people thought I was smart. That people thought yeah. I was like a fucking pioneer and a genius, even yeah. though that put me in the worst position in my life for two and a half years where I, I right. felt like I <laughs> worst mental place that I've ever been in. Um, right. But you had all these people who you looked up to saying that you were a great business person and you'd done this great deal and wasn't this so smart mm -hmm. and like and yeah, and you it, there's it, there's so much power in having the cool people or the people you think are cool think you are cool. There's so much power in having the people who you want respect from giving you that respect. It's so intoxicating. But then the thing that I had to figure out was that like, you know whose opinion I actually care about? Like ac actually, actually, Sarah's. Mm -hmm. You know, like my best friend, Chris and Marina. Like I care about their opinions. I care about... I how much more does it matter what my kids think of me than it does what, you know, the, the fancy business people who were telling us to sell, uh, our educational media company th think of me, mm -hmm. you know, like they can think that we made a stupid decision, but like you and I both know that, um, that's not, the, you, 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 when you, <laughs> the thing about selling something is you don't own it anymore. <laughs> Right. Like yeah. as the thing that nobody tells you, um, you don't own it anymore. And that means that like you're, you're working for somebody who does own it and you're contractually obligated to work for them. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I had to go through this period of my life too, where I realized that like, well, what I value, and this is, this is why we stayed in Indianapolis too, because, you know, there was this all this push and urge to, you know, go to LA and do LA things. You had this successful movie, you should be producing, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And like, but like, where's the, where's the actual quality of life? Like, what do I want to, what do I want to do with my attention? And like, what I, what I want to do with my attention after this is like, go, you know, I, I spent dozens of hours writing this Dungeons and Dragons thing that 
and I love these kids, but like, it's going to be lost on them. You know, they're just going to kill the, they're just going to kill the dragon and feel really good, good that they killed the dragon. And like, they're going to miss a lot of my nuance, Phil. I don't like to complain, but they're going to miss a lot of the sort of multiplicity of meaning in some of these moments because they're 10. Um, but that's what matters. Yeah. That's where the that's where the joy is. That's where the meaning is. Like the joy is is in experiences and it's in the people that you experience stuff with. Like it took me forever to figure that out. Yeah. I, I think of the way that I think of it is what am I gonna remember me signing some fucking contract, or am I gonna remember like my son on my shoulders at the zoo? Right? Yeah. 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 And it's it's that close to yeah. the chest happiness. I think that's because there are different happinesses, uh, but that's the one that matters. Yeah. Oh, that's a very nice. Uh, that is. Uh, that's a very visceral image because I know exactly what you mean when you say the close to the chest happiness. Like, yeah. And that's that's the one that matters. So let's go off now and um, be with those people who give us that close to the chest happiness. And I am so appreciative of this conversation. And I have to say, uh, you know, through ups and downs and, uh, and strange, strange times and good ones, uh, it, it has always been, um, it has always been really, really lovely to be able to call you a colleague. And, um, and I, I look forward to seeing what you do over the next 14 years. That's the, that's the nicest way anyone uh, said, I need you to go fuck off. <laughs> no, I do need you to go. F- I, I, I got, I got some Dungeons and Dragons to get into. No, I appreciate you, John. Dengar the Night Serpent is in big trouble. <laughs> I appreciate you, buddy. And same, same to you. It's uh, I know that like we we only talk now and then. We got a, a, the the past of of starting up at the same time. But even though we don't have, we're not super super tight. Every time I see uh, you and Hank killing it, I I feel like uh, connection and pride and happiness that you're doing well. No, oh, thanks. It's same goes for you. So uh, th- please thank your team for me. They made this easy, and uh, they did they they did a uh, they did a, an admirable job with. Uh, Somebody who, despite the fact that I've been on the internet professionally for like 15 years, is still has a second grade level understanding of Skype. <laughs> <laughs> don't uh, don't take that compliment, guys. I, uh, <laughs> don't don't at all. I appreciate you, John. You take that. All right, Have a yeah, great take one, buddy. care, Phil. Great to talk to you. Same.